The Juvenile Law Center's Leadership Prize is awarded to outstanding advocates working to advance the rights and well-being of youth in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Just as these efforts to advance the field will continue, though, the innovations should continue to be recognized and noted and celebrated. As a result, it gives me great pleasure to be able to announce tonight the establishment of the Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize. Every prize needs an inaugural winner. And so the inaugural winner of the Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize for 2015 is Bob Schwartz. Many of us in our profession are asked, you know, what do, what do we do? And we say, well, we're lawyers for children. But that's not really the story. We're building a better world for them. You and me, the folks at Juvenile Law Center, all of our co colleagues, our partners, our funders, uh, that's what we're building together. All of you are part of this movement. We all care about children, we all care about young people, and that we know that we could do so much harm, and we have done so much harm by incarcerating our young people. I'm happy to say that we've been able to make significant changes uh, in international standards on child soldiers, on child domestic workers, and on children working with uh, mercury in gold mines. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you to ensure every child the prize of a loving, safe, permanent family. You know, we're all getting started. You know, we've, you know, I come, I stand on the, on the, the shoulders of giants, and there's, there are many, but I also know many people like me that are young and up and coming that are going to do much greater things, and, and I'm proud, and I'm, and I'm humbled, and I'm honored, and I'm grateful. I believe that Americans should be informed that our vision of justice is skewed, manipulated by racism, classism, and stubbornness that keeps outdated policy in place. Juvenile Law Center, thank you so much for everything that you stand for. I appreciate you. I also want to thank my family, uh, Stonely Foundation, who ha helped me when I did finish the Human Rights Watch report, which was amazing, based on 500 interviews of children that were raised on registries. Our strongest messengers are people who are formerly incarcerated men and women and victims of violent crime. We all have the obligation to stop to listen and to elevate and lift up our young people and to celebrate their hope and their vision and to let them lead us to a better world for every single young person who's in foster care. We can get there. There is an unprecedented opportunity to change our country's approach to child welfare, to create one that is far more prevention oriented, racially just, and centered on the needs of children and families. You don't just use forensic psychiatrists and psych or psychologists. You have to consult with the, the world of the psychiatrists and psychologists who know how these things affect kids. I learned many critical lessons in my first case. Children and families suffer great harm in systems that value convenience over compassion. One person paying attention can disrupt giant bureaucracies. Over several months, we visited inmates in Kansas, Missouri, and Texas, including one man on death row, all who grew up in foster care. All of them described the trauma of being removed from their homes. Michelle Voorhees, an inmate in Kansas, told us, every single move is a traumatic experience, and the more you get moved around, the more trauma you endure. Moments like this really give us an opportunity to think about why we advocate for children. And I can't help but think of all of the black and brown children who have been impacted by policing in America. Right now is a time where I believe we can transform child welfare between the technology push, the new funding, the centering of lived experience in a way that it has never been centered before. I I'm taking this as a recognition of the importance of scientific research that's done by myself and by many colleagues uh, to further the work that you folks do. I often tell my students, if you're going to do good psychology and law research, you need to have a lawyer advising or mentoring you in order to make sure that if you get worthwhile results, they're going to be legally relevant and applicable. Since I've been released, I have been paying it forward, being a voice for other young people, 
still in the system. Other young people whose voices are not heard, whose faces are not known. It's something that God has given me a heart for. And I mean, it's not really work to me, to be honest. It feels more of a purpose. So I appreciate being honored for that, that being recognized with this award. And I just wanna say that it gives me so much motivation to keep going even harder, to keep fighting even harder. And I'm gonna do just that. I hope that this leadership prize will help to spotlight the growing abolitionist movement to replace the logic of surveilling and separating families in the name of protecting children with an approach that truly cares for their welfare. Thank you, Juvenile Law Center, from the bottom of my heart. Please welcome to the stage, Kalia Ali and Jacob Ali Wertheimer. Good evening, it is such a privilege and honor to be here with you, even more so to carry on my father's legacy with truly such a laudable cause. Uh, my father, having been boxed for Muhammad Ali, fought many fights, but every day, Juvenile Law Center is on the front line of fighting one of the greatest battles and most laudable causes that there is. It's been a pleasure to be a board member. It's been a pleasure to be the mother to this fine young man standing next to me. We're here tonight together to also send a message because it is about legacy and this is about children and it is about youth and it is about the next generation. And I thought, how befitting would it be for me to have this opportunity with my son no more than it's an opportunity for me to be here in the breath and the voice and the spirit of my father who can't be with us here this evening. And I know in my heart that if there was one thing he would want us doing in his name to preserve and cultivate his legacy, it's the very work that I've been doing with Juvenile Law Center and other amazing organizations. I sit here looking at the great one, the other goat, Marsha Levick. <laughs> And uh, I'm just filled with such inspiration, such love, and, and absolute humility. And, and I've had the opportunity to already meet some of our award winners this evening, and I'm just so humbled. And at that, I will pass things over to my son. I just wanted to say that I'm so pleased to have the honor to be here and to be able to take part in celebrating our leadership award winners tonight, Xavier Micklerath Bay, Peter Leon and Amanda Alexander. I've had the pleasure of meeting two of you already tonight, and I can really say already that we're really fortunate to be able to celebrate such wonderful people. And I'm really looking forward to having further conversations with all of you. And I really advise everybody to take the opportunity that you can to spend time with these amazing people, because they truly are leaders and they truly are visionaries, and the work that they're doing is really something to be celebrated. And you don't get the opportunity to speak to people like that very often. I also want to cite 15 years of the youth advocacy program as a young man coming into his own in this world. I think that, uh, you know, that program is something that really means a lot to me. And as somebody who spent time working with the Juvenile Law Center, um, you know, it really means so much to me that what is the point of juvenile justice if not to create space for young people to make further change in this world? And I think that's something that they've done such a wonderful job of. So I really want to acknowledge everyone here. And I really hope that we all have a wonderful night tonight. I really look forward to meeting and speaking with as many of you as possible. And I just hope we can all have a great time. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Sue Mangold and Tammy Benton. Thanks, Kalia and Jacob. I want to thank all of you, all of you, for being with us tonight. Nobody loves these sorts of things more than me. And it just gives us all such great energy. Um, I'm looking at my buddies and our youth advocates, and it just means so much together, our whole community together, our wonderful staff, our supporters, people who have worked with us in the past, members from ICANN, our board of directors, on it goes. A special thanks to Marquis Richardson 
for being with us tonight and really helping us lift up our youth advocacy program. You'll see him later tonight. And I wanted to take just a minute to recognize one of our past recipients. You saw her close out the video. Dorothy Roberts is with us tonight. And she, she was one of the recipients during our virtual years during the pandemic. So we're so glad to be back in person for this, our eighth Leadership Prize celebration. The winners tonight, as you'll hear, really capture the breadth of our work and our field. And I feel like tonight is a counter narrative to sort of what you hear so much about young people and what's happening in the cities and what's happening with juvenile justice. This is really inspiring is an overused term, but it just fills us with so much positive energy. Uh, Peter Leone has been a longtime partner and his groundbreaking work about education of youth in placement has been work that's been really vital to the work of Juvenile Law Center through the years. Amanda Alexander and her strong voice around abolition and investing in youth and families and communities and really showing through the Detroit, Detroit Justice Center how that can work. And Xavier McElrath Bay, a longtime colleague and the co-founder of ICANN, which is the Incarcerated Children's Action Network. Um, we are just so thrilled to honor his work with, young pe with people who were sentenced as children to life without parole, and it really bridges the work of Juvenile Law Center um, with his incredible work. As you know, we fight to protect the rights of youth in the justice and child welfare systems, and I always remind people that when we say justice, we mean not only youth in the juvenile justice system, but also in the young people who were tried as adults. We ask you to join with us um, to keep this cause going. We have a QR code in your, if you feel moved tonight to make an extra donation. Um, it should be in your programs. It's all over the room. And again, I just want to thank you for being here. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy being together. I hope I get to speak with all of you. And I want to introduce our board chair, Dr. Tammy Benton. Tammy is the psychiatrist in chief and the executive director and chair um, of the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She's also the president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And when we asked her to be our board chair, she was saying, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm the rising president of the American Academy. Okay. You know, Tammy's been a longtime colleague and we're thrilled that she's chairing our board. Tammy? So, so thank you, Susan, for those generous comments. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Board of Directors for the Juvenile Law Center. And I want to thank you all for joining us in this celebration to honor the incredible work of Amanda, Peter, and Xavier. Um, I also want to thank the members of the 2023 Selection Committee for selecting um, such an incredible group to share their time with us tonight. I also want to make sure that we thank all the new and long-standing members of the Juvenile Law Center who continue to support and fund us and to make the work that we do possible. Your support is, ex is essential in helping us navigate the challenges that young people in juvenile justice and child welfare face. And we know the challenges are greater than they have been in some time. Your partnership is also essential in supporting our staff in their dedicated work in the ongoing fight for youth and their rights and well-being. So before joining the Juvenile Law Center Board, um, I was a longtime supporter and advocate based on the incredible work I'd seen from the Juvenile Law Center, but also um, as an advocate myself as a child psychiatrist, I recognize the harms to the mental health of young people and the harms to their well-being that occurs in juvenile justice and child welfare. I stand with the Juvenile Law Center and the staff, and recently I literally stood on the street with the Juvenile Law Center and staff in the cold weather arguing against the harm that the Juvenile Justice Center, um, the JJC, JJSC, which is next door to my office, <laughs> actually inflicts on young people. And so I stand with all of you in your commitment to our young people. I want to thank you for your continued support. It is essential in addressing the challenges that young people face today, and we know they're more, they're more challenging than they have been in the past. But I feel secure in knowing that we're going to be successful in addressing these issues. And when I think of the incredible work 
that you guys are doing, um, our honorees tonight, um, I'm confident that we'll reach our goals. So thank you, and I look forward to hearing more from you tonight. Please welcome to the stage, Marsha Levick. Wow. So good evening, welcome. Hey, hi, hello. This is amazing. Um, it is true that no one is happier in this moment than Sue. <laughs> her, her ebullience and enthusiasm is infectious, however. And so um, I just share it. We have talked so much about how we have not been together since 2019. And this is just really wonderful to see your faces. Um, I'm meeting new people tonight. I'm seeing old friends and old colleagues, um, not in the age sense, you know, just sort of like known you a long time. Some of you are young. Um, but anyway, it's just really um, fabulous to see you and so grateful um, that you are all here tonight celebrating with us. So I have this wonderful um, honor tonight to present our first 2023 Leadership Prize um, to Peter Leone. And I have actually known Peter for decades, we have to acknowledge that. <laughs> and um, I can share that I first met Peter uh, in the late 1990s working on some litigation that literally was a direct byproduct of the super predator era. Uh, we were suing all of the jails across the state of Pennsylvania for failing to provide education for young people who had all been prosecuted uh, and charged as adults. And uh, unsurprisingly, they were not really getting edu any education in those jails. And we consulted with Peter about how to um, approach the litigation. We won half of it and we lost half of it, which is kind of how the legal world goes. But um, what I want to really stress about, about Peter is that Peter is the go-to guy on juvenile correctional education. And I think that when we think about at Juvenile Law Center, what the Leadership Prize means, what we are honoring with this prize, which is really visionaries, leading lights, pioneers, innovators, that's Peter. I feel like you created the field of juvenile correctional education. And as we sit here today, and I'm looking at some of my colleagues out in the audience, we are involved in litigation now against another horrible juvenile correctional facility that fortunately is kind of closed and kind of not closed. Um, you know, we're still dealing with educational challenges. We still haven't figured out how to provide education to children in a system uh, that for as long as we've been in it, which is a really long time, many decades, um, actually remains pretty broken. Um, but we carry on, uh, and we could not really, I think, launch this fight effectively without the leading light that Peter provided to us. So I asked Peter today um, to share with me three things that he wanted me to share with you. So I'm going to share them. And so the first, of course, was his passion for this work. And what I thought was really so insightful and kind of magical about the way he expressed it is that education is about transformation. And you really can't have transformation without, without education. And that that is how you have approached your work in this space. The second is, of course, that although he is allegedly retired, he's apparently still working and not surprising either, um, and continues really to be monitoring um, probably one of the most challenging juvenile justice systems in the country right now in LA, where horrible things continue to happen there. Um, so they are lucky to have you. And lastly, he also shared that he is an avid softball player and that uh, in his retirement, he is apparently a member of several, like 70 plus, 70 year old plus leagues, um, which I totally support because I think what that tells us is that indeed 70 is the new 43. <laughs> so it is my absolute pleasure, privilege, and honor to welcome you and to present you with the 2023 Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize.
I guess this is my time to say thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm really touched um, to, to receive this award. And I, I'm so honored by the Juvenile Law Center, which I think is, is really a premier um, organization that advocates um, for the rights of children. Um, I, I should say, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my parents and their instilling in, myth, instilling in me as a child um, the important importance of social justice and the idea that uh, to those to whom much is given, uh, much is expected. And um, I, I really think that we all have uh, a role to play to make this a better world uh, for others. Um, and for me, the niche has been education. Um, I'd also like to thank the selection committee um, for, for uh, honoring me with this award. Um, I'd also like to thank my wife, Diane Gregg, who is a, has been my partner uh, over the years uh, for her patience and understanding. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge my sister, Lucy, who's here. Um, um, uh, as Marcia said, and thank you for that lovely uh, introduction, Marcia, um, educational, I really believe it's transformational. It's also foundational. Um, I, I really think that when we think about building a better world, Education is, is so foundational to, to all of us. And all of us at some point wouldn't be here tonight if there wasn't somebody somewhere at some time during our educational careers who didn't make a difference in our lives. They may not remember us, but we sure remember who they are. And it's also very cool to get this this week because this is Teacher Appreciation Week. So again, thank you all very much. Now welcome to the stage, Ria Saha Shah. Hi everyone. Um, so over 20 years ago, in what was maybe another lifetime, I was a third grade teacher in the Detroit Public Schools. And among my students were children whose families were separated from incarceration, by incarceration, uh, the child welfare system, and insecure housing. Some struggled with food scarcity and limited access to health care to address chronic conditions related to their environment. Not a single organization existed at the time that could address these needs holistically. And my students and their families didn't have access to a legal services program to advocate for them. Until years later, Dr. Amanda Alexander founded the Detroit Justice Center. At six years old, Amanda's father was incarcerated and the trauma of that separation shaped the lawyer and the leader she would later become. As a law student, she authored a guide for incarcerated parents on how to maintain their rights with their children. And as she began her legal career, she represented children, parents who were at risk of termination of their parental rights and worked to get their children out of foster care and home with relatives. The families on whose behalf she worked were also trapped in cycles of policing, ticketing, and arrests. And she saw how families like her own relied upon their extended families and their communities to navigate the series of systemic failures that were thrown their way. People would set up community bail funds or charter buses from churches to send their children upstate to visit incarcerated parents or take care of each other's children when someone was locked up. So she later launched the Detroit Justice Center to harness this energy and work alongside communities to transform the justice system and to promote an equitable, Detroit where mass incarceration doesn't exist. Her work takes a community-based lawyering approach and has included providing legal services to keep individuals out of jail and prison, in their homes with their families, and free from the barriers that we know criminal justice system involvement um, enacts. She sees families as whole units, acknowledging that the needs and rights of children can only be furthered by doing so. As executive director, Amanda established and honed the organization's 
innovative approach to community-based lawyering and increased its reach exponentially. So I could now run down the list of awards and accolades that Amanda has received or his, her extremely impressive list of accolades. I mean, she's brilliant. She has a PhD in international history, y'all. So as we honor her today, it may seem as though we're merely adding another feather to her cap. Yet this award has special meaning to us at Juvenile Law Center. We honor people whose vision and life work have changed the lives of children and have shaped the field for future generations. As a visionary leader, Amanda brings an approach to the law that requires us to examine how it can be a tool in dismantling the systems that it has created. And she's a thought leader on how to move away from carceral responses to violence. Juvenile Law Center recently adopted an abolitionist framework in its strategic plan that recognizes that the child welfare, criminal, and juvenile legal systems cause immense harm to young people and therefore need to be dismantled. This transformation can only come by envisioning a world that does not surveil and tear children and families apart. So as we embarked on this new territory, we look to the seminal work of leaders like Amanda who have demonstrated what it truly means to be centered in community, who never com compromise on the fundamental questions of freedom, and who help us to understand the contours of abolition and what that means for the relationship to children in the legal system. So this year, very soon, Amanda will be stepping down as executive director of the DJC. So I know you'll share my excitement and anticipation as we see what this force is going to do next. Congratulations on an amazing career so far. Um, it is my great honor to present you with this year's Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize. That was gorgeous, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am so, so glad to be here and so deeply honored by this award. Thank you to the Juvenile Law Center uh, for every ounce of energy that you pour into tearing down unjust systems and building up the world that we need. Thank you for centering the power and freedom dreams of young people in this work. I want to shout out all of the youth advocates who are here tonight. <laughs> I also want to thank some of my Philly and Pennsylvania comrades, uh, some of whom are here tonight. Um, Amistad Law Project, led by Chris Henderson. <laughs> Abolitionist Law Center. <laughs> the People's Paper Co-op and Penn Law's new Advocacy for Racial and Civil Justice Clinic under the leadership of Karen McLennan. I am grateful for the ways that you, along with the Juvenile Law Center, are expanding our sense of what's possible. I'm grateful to draw courage and inspiration from you all. And thank you to my incredible team at the Detroit Justice Center, now 33 people strong, Every single one of them is fiercely committed to our clients and our community partners and to fighting like hell for the society that we need. At the Detroit Justice Center, we recognize that it is not enough to talk about ending mass incarceration. We have to talk about what we are building up in order to create safe and thriving communities. We will tear down jails and prisons, but just as importantly, we need to think about what we're going to invest in in order to restore our communities. And how do we get from here to there? At DJC, we're doing it through an approach that we call defense, offense, and dreaming, because we believe that you need all three under one roof. We provided life-changing legal services to over 5,000 people, so addressing those fines, fees, tickets, warrants, um, things that keep people shut out of the economy and separated from their families. We go on offense with our economic equity practice. So we are shoring up some of the freedom dreams that Detroiters have for their neighborhoods. So far, we've formed three community land trusts, 
and 12 worker-owned cooperative businesses, mostly led by black women. Our Just Cities Lab is where we dream and where we invite our clients and community partners to dream with us and where we pilot some of those programs that they come up with. Shortly after we opened our doors five years ago, Wayne County was trying to build a new $533 million jail complex, including a new youth jail. And so we decided to hold a youth summit and ask young people, how could we spend this half a billion dollars in ways that would make you feel safe and valued and empowered? And you will not be surprised, not one of them said that we need more jails or more police. Instead, they said, let's build a mental health spa. So this would be a place where you could go in on the first floor and have individual therapy to talk through whatever's making you anxious, whatever's on your heart. And you go up to the second floor and you have space for group therapy. And you could do conflict mediation there. And then you would go up to the roof and these young people said that you would just be able to look out at the Detroit River and feel a sense of calm on your spirit. They had it designed down to what would be the most soothing paint colors on the walls for people. One boy said, if I had that money, I would give it away to my neighbors because I know that if they felt safe and okay, then I would feel safe and okay. One girl said, I wish there were a building where you could go and if you needed money, like really needed money, you could get what you needed without filling out a lot of paperwork. These kids said, pay our teachers fix the lead pipes in our schools. They said, create affordable housing and make sure that it's accessible for my grandmother's wheelchair. They said, build regional transit, build restorative justice centers. These are freedom dreams. And they're especially sacred because they are young people's freedom dreams. It was powerful to be in a room full of people for that afternoon who had not yet bought into society's myth that anyone is disposable. And the fact is that we can build all of this and more. It'll take shifting our abundance out of policing, prosecuting, and caging people, and into creating the care infrastructure that will help people thrive. Freedom dreaming is about defining the future worth fighting for. We have to use our full imaginations and define our freedom for ourselves, otherwise we get caught up in these battles that are too small, otherwise we'll settle for too little. At DJC, we often use a question that one of my mentors and friends, Vince Warren, of the Center for Constitutional Rights, posed. He said, five generations from now, what will black people thank us for? Five generations from now, what will black people thank us for? It is a beautiful question and it keeps us focused on doing the long-term intergenerational work that will last. I believe that we build a just society by stitching these local experiments and freedom dreaming together and learning from each other. This is how bit by bit we create the communities that we need. We're not talking about ending policing and prisons and the family regulation system overnight. It's about building up the care infrastructure that will make those things obsolete. This transformative work is already happening in Detroit, in Philadelphia, and in so many cities and towns, and it is where I find my hope. Thank you again, Juvenile Law Center, for your vote of confidence in my freedom dreams. Thank you again for the space that you create for young people to dream and build. That is precisely what we need more of. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Abdallah Latif. Greetings, everyone. Someone made the horrible mistake of giving me a microphone without a timer. <laughs> but I will be conscious of our time and the delicious meal that awaits us. But I also want to invite us into a space that fills my heart and mind in this moment. As a person who, as a child, was disappeared from society and served 31 years in cages, 
across this commonwealth. Often in darkness and despair and hopelessness. There were a few things that you could hang your hat on. One was a faith in the creator the all-knowing, the all-hearing, the most merciful, the compassionate. Another was watching CNN or C-SPAN broadcast from this noble place, this auspicious place, watching Jeffrey Rosen entertain guests that would talk about liberation, that would talk about law and justice, that would introduce a paradigm around prison reform, sentencing reform, given the idea that there were people out there who actually got it. When we talk about leaders, who spread light in the world. Often that light isn't appreciated except in the darkness of despair in which lights shine brightest. And so I remember as if it was yesterday, sitting in my cell and receiving a flyer from the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network newly formed, co-founded by Xavier McElrath Bay. A person with lived experience, a person with a history not unlike mine and many of the colleagues who sit amongst you in this room today. And I thought about Xavier's experience, and we have on page eight his biography. I won't go into those details. But I think about Xavier as a child, of 13 years age, of age, inducted into a gang before he reached the age of puberty faced all type of trauma, the aces of which we could spend the next hour speaking about. The horrors of childhood, both in the home and the streets of Chicago. And yet he'd forged a leadership, first with gangs, then in prison, and then as he returned to us as a leader within our society, in our communities, in the organization with, for which I am proud to be a member and represent today. But beyond all of the accolades and the leadership that Xavier has exemplified in the organization for which we represent in the campaign for the fair sentence of youth, his leadership and vision around the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network. His leadership as it exemplified in his community, all of those things were an example of him spreading light and darkness. But I feel compelled in this moment to recognize not how he shows up as a social justice warrior and advocate, not as how he shows up as a friend and a colleague, but how he shows up as a human being, as a husband, as a father, as the brother who many of us wish we had. It is a deep honor and pleasure to acknowledge the individual who is responsible for many of us being in the space in which we share. It was his story, it was his courage, 
It was his fortitude and vulnerability. Going into state houses, going into communities amongst legislators, lawyers, convincing them that no child is born bad. It is a mantra which he, li he lives daily. It is one that is reflective of our reality. And it is one that I hope that we in this room continue to embrace. That no child, in fact, is born bad. The circumstances to which many of our children are born into, many of our children have to contend with on the daily are circumstances that they themselves did not create. And yet, despite the darkness that exists in that space, this, despite all of the anguish of being hyper-marginalized, being disregarded, being disappeared in a society of eight million people, what we see through the example of Xavier, Xavier McElrath Bay is that children, if given an opportunity, can overcome, can succeed, can prosper, and do marvelous things in this world. They give to the community. They give to our society, to our nation. They give to their families. What Xavier has exemplified in leadership is nothing other than the common love for humanity that we all should have for one another. It is with great honor and pleasure that I present the 2023 Leadership Award to my friend, my colleague, my leader, my brother, Xavier X. McElrath Bay. I just, I just want to say the honor, first and foremost, to be in this space with all of you and to have such an extraordinary introduction by a movement leader, someone who I look up to and inspires me. I, I, I've, I've cried enough already, <laughs> my God. And I just want to say thanks to all of you. And I want to please, along with my brother here, I, I want to invite all the ICANN brothers and sisters to please come up here and join me. I want to invite all the youth, youth advocacy program participants, please come up here, please. And whether, whether your party's programs or not, if you've ever been held in the grip of the juvenile or criminal justice system, if you've ever been in the grip of the child welfare system, please come up here now. And if you're wondering if I'm talking to you, then yes, I'm talking to you. Please come right now. Thank you all so much. I honestly, I, I asked for permission to do this, you all. I, I, I know I could be a bit disruptive, but I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask. I'm going to be polite. I'm going to ask. And they said, as long as the stage can hold us up, we'll be OK. <laughs> I, I, just, I just, I want you all to look at the faces on this stage. I want you all to know that we have a common thread of experiences. And I was reflecting upon the fact that, on a more personal level, that Juvenile Law Center was founded the same year that I was born. 
I don't remember that day, of course. I don't remember that. <laughs> but what I do remember very vividly was the police coming to my home and them knocking on the door and asking for my stepfather, who was wanted for abusing us. My mother hit him in the bathroom. They kicked beyond the door and got into the bathroom and arrested him. And my first experience was in the back of a squad car, seeing the image of my mother getting smaller as they drove away, as they drove me and my siblings away. While in the grips of the, of the child welfare system, being in, a, being in the foster care system, my siblings and I ex experienced even far more uh, abuse, far more than I would even care to share here. And by the time I was eight and a half and my mother convinced them that she had a place of her own, which she really didn't, her friend pretended that her place was my mother's, um, they allowed us to go home and once again found myself and my siblings in the, in, in, in the hands of yet another abusive stepfather. By the time I was nine years old, I was just running away. My first arrest happened then for stealing a candy bar from a grocery store. Two years later, while being a part of a gang, I almost lost my life when my best friend shot me by accident, almost lost my life. And then soon after getting arrested for gun charges was placed again into the foster care system in, the, in, Mar in Maryville Academy in the Spains, Illinois. I stood there for about a year and a half before I witnessed the brutal killing of a 13-year-old child named Waquita Wallace just feet from me. And sadly, I and other kids ran away. Slowly but surely, we trickled away from the Volts home. And I found myself back in the streets, deeply immersed in gang life, getting arrests over and over again. By the time I was 13 years old, I had 19 arrests and seven convictions. My last arrest, three months after witnessing the brutal killing of Waquita Wallace, was for a first-degree murder. What was unspoken in my life, what was spoken in the lives of individuals here, is that oftentimes it was about trauma. Oftentimes it was about the need for love and healing. A thousand and one intrusions upon our lives that were unaddressed. The many instances and opportunities where people could have just stepped in and saw us as children. Sadly, they saw us as monsters. The truth of the matter is that many of us Though, though we had been through that horrendous experience, either in the hands of the child welfare system or in the hands of the juvenile justice system or the criminal justice system, I'm sure many of us can relate and agree that there were times when we wondered if anyone really cared. We wondered if anyone ever really wanted or, or wanted to ensure that we had safety, well-being, nurturance in our lives. And little did we know there are people just like you all here, the Juvenile Law Center, Marsha, Susan, you know, Jessica, so many from Juvenile Law Center who were advocating and fighting for us, and we didn't even know it. And interestingly, peeking into our lives, and slowly we're seeing, not just in relationships of, of, of litigation and representation, but seeing how we're, you are fighting at the Supreme Court level. To know that Juvenile Law Center played a big role in Roper, Graham, Miller, Montgomery, while many of these individuals were inside, there's a, there's a full circle moment here, knowing that my organization, the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, was advocating and fighting in state legislators to advance reforms and giving us an opportunity to step into a space as leaders. These are things that, were, that are healing in our lives. And though I don't know the personal stories of the youth advocates who are part of that program here at Juvenile Law Center, what I recognize and see is that you all see the strategic uh, benefits and values and expertise that they bring into the work of youth advocacy. There's no one better positioned to inform this work than those who have been directly impacted, whether by the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, or the criminal justice system. And so we want to thank you all for giving us this opportunity to both be seen as human beings, to be recognized as worthy of love, and to be treated with humanity. And now in this most beautiful moment as in, in, in the movement for fair sentencing and, 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 and age-appropriate trauma-informed treatment of kids, to be leaders. Imagine that, you all. To think that once upon a time, we were once thrown away by society, and yet we've been un, un, uncovered as leaders. So I want to thank all of you for believing in us and for trusting in our leadership. And I, on a personal level, Jody, I want to say I love you. I thank you. I can go on and on here. And there are many on this, on this stage here who can agree that your love has made, been transformative in our lives. 
Marsha, thank you for fighting for many of us and for believing that there are people in the states who you directly represented. Montgomery, Henry Montgomery is free because of your stalwart advocacy, your belief in Sarah Fair Chance and Fair Chance for Kids and, and not wanting to set up for less for America's children. We ask that all of you look at us and know that we appreciate you all. Marcy and Sid, I love you all. My wife and my child, I am so blessed. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I am so blessed, you all. I just want to say, you know, people are like, man, you know, when, when, you, when you talk about strategy, whenever I have troubles at work, I'm like, Marcy, I need to talk to you. <laughs> Check this out, babe. <laughs> ultimate, ultimate support in my life. And my staff and my team, oh, my God. The, the, the extraordinary leaders in our space, our board members, Anita, I see you our soon-to-be chair of our organization. I'm so proud to be standing here with all of these individuals who have really inspired me. And I, I look across those, those who are on the stage with me and honestly, I oftentimes wonder, am I even worthy? These individuals are powerful. They're deep, soul-searching leaders who know the intimacies of this system far better, far better than I do. And that's why they're up here because they inspire me. I love you all. <laughs> I'm not gonna take over the program, <laughs> but please meet these individuals up here. If you haven't had a chance to yet, please meet them connect with them, get to know them. They've enriched and changed my life, and they've reinforced within me that, yes, it's important to lead with love. There were times when I've led with bitterness and sadness, and I've seen how that has not been transformative. But I noticed the moment that I set those bad feelings to the side, and I try to see the humanity in everybody, even the naysayers and disbelievers, and I lead with love, something happens. And I can't quite explain it, but I know it's the way to go. And so with that, I just want to say I love all of you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Marquis Richardson. Wow, that was special. <laughs> um, I already decided that I wasn't going to be one of those speakers that come up and say hello, and then uh, the crowd just says hello. And then the speaker says, oh, that's not good enough. Hello! And then the crowd begrudgingly says, hello, mother, you know. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say hello, good evening. Uh, it's beautiful to be here. I'm happy, privileged, and honored uh, to be here and share this space with you all. Um, I was told to introduce myself because I don't know, uh, y'all don't know who I am, but my name is Marquis Richardson. Um, uh, brother, friend, person, husband, dog owner, um, an actor, an activist for many different causes uh, across the, the world and, and whatnot. Um, but I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to introduce the Juvenile Law Center's video that celebrates 15 years of tireless work um, from the Youth Advocate Program. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. And I must shamefully admit that I hadn't heard of JLC um, before last year when Katie Otto reached out. Shout out to Katie. Uh, shout out to Katie. <laughs> the entire staff. She DM'd me on Twitter, 
And I never check the DMs and stuff on Twitter, but for whatever reason, that day I did, and it was literally after uh, I had just finished working on this project called Unprisoned for Hulu. Um, thank you. <laughs> where I play a criminal justice social caseworker, not to be confused with a PO, no shade to POs, but that's not, that's not what he was. Um, so Katie reached out and I went to the website and I, immediately I saw, I'm paraphrasing, uh, the, the main cause and mission of JLC and that's to advocate for the rights of children in the welfare and justice systems. And I was like, oh shit. I didn't know kids had rights, because I'm starting to think of all the times, you know, I got my butt beat by my parents and my grandparents and, and, and whatnot. I'm like, oh wow, kids have rights. Young people have rights. And who better to advocate and lead a program than people that have that experience? Um, so shout out to the young people, the young advocacy program. I was so impressed and inspired and uh, grateful just to be here, and it, it really brings me joy uh, and inspiration to go back into uh, what I do as an artist uh, in the world. So thank you very much, and without further ado, here's the video. An advocate is compassion. An advocate is necessary. An advocate is brave. An advocate is a partner. An advocate is courage. An advocate is a mentor. Our first group, we had um, Rhea and myself and uh, a social work intern. I think we probably had about 10-ish, give or take, young people in our first um, group of um, what was then called Juveniles for Justice. Um, and we used to meet weekly eat, snack, talk about the justice system, think about what worked about it, if anything, and what didn't, um, and kind of try to unpack what it was that we wanted to see in the world. We would have, like, around the first, like, one or two weeks, it was always ice breaking. We Obviously, we do ice breaking every day. But, like, the beginning, it would, all, it would be all about um, how you want to share your story. Like, when you're in a system, you think you're going through certain stuff by yourself, or you don't think that, you know, many people share the same story as you. I was surprised that a lot of, like, a lot of youth advocates and some of the similar situations that we all were going through. So this right here is the, uh, is the educational toolkit that we created uh, for the Love of Success. Uh, we formatted um, the educational piece uh, for foster youth uh, in like a guide, basically uh, putting together a bunch of resources uh, for the foster youth. Um, because a lot of the foster youth that, that worked on the project and um, had a lot of experience with the educational system uh, felt like, um, you know, it wasn't a lot of resources. You know, when I had a part of it, actually, it just made me happy. And it made, it, 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 it made, it made it feel like everything we did and all the, all the things we went through, you know, sharing our stories and all the footwork we put in was, you know, was worthwhile. You know, speaking to legislators to try to get life without parole ended in PA and then it was ended and then doing, you know, working and networking with the people who were released due to that. Sometimes you get, you know, tangible things that make you feel like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing something for the world. I'm doing something positive. I'm not just talking. You know, all of us care about this work. We come to this work for different reasons as advocates. But to say that you get to engage in efforts alongside the very young people that you tend to represent in the courtroom and that you can partner with them um, on changes for other young people who might not have that opportunity because they're in prison or still in foster care. Um, and you can say, you know, we pass a law that's going to effectively, you know, change someone's life, whether it's our young people at JLC or other young people, you know, who are in our program. I think that's a phenomenal thing. When we was working on our plan to like get like a an ombudsman person in Philly, we was talking about like as a group, me and my uh, me and the other youth advocates, we wanted one because majority of us didn't feel safe like reaching out for help when we needed it. You know, I remember giving my 
testimony to city council and writing an op-ed and uh, sharing my thoughts with my you know fellow friends uh, who are also youth advocates and we really uh, pushed the point home and we finally got it and um, the ombudsman office is now a thing. Um, because of their testimony, I 100% believe that that is why we got the first allotment for the youth ombuds budget and how we were able to push through and ultimately uh, you know, hold the city accountable for really having a purpose and a vision for the office. Youth advocates played a critical role in the passage of Act One in three ways. First, they're the ones who identified the problem and said we needed a legislative solution. Second, they sat through revision after revision of the draft. We would go back to them and say, is this answering the problem? And they would put their comments in and their edits and we'd sit down and talk about it. And third, they're fierce, effective advocates for change. In a lot of ways, is it's that lawyers don't think outside the box. They don't think expansively. They're not understanding the intricacies of the harm that they're seeing. They tend to see a problem and grab for, oh, this must be it, instead of getting to the root cause of the problem. We decided to focus on housing for older youth who are transitioning between like 18 and 21 um, range. And we, first we met with a lot of organizations in the city to kind of learn about homelessness and what living kind of looks like and um, are there stipends that are being given to like older youth and what supports are set in place or the lack of supports that are being set in place. And we use all of that info to host a town hall that we had in City Hall in June of last year. I think given the success that this model has had and the direct impact that it's had on the youth that are in the program and that can speak to the benefits that they've received in being in the program, I think it's a model that will continue to be replicated across the country and the world. I think, um, I think one of the things that I've seen personally is that youth are the true experts um, when it comes to policy change in this area. And so I think they need to be front and center. People are moved. And um, especially when we're dealing with unjust systems, people have to be moved for justice. And that's what the project does. Youth advocacy is important because hope is important. Hope is what drives you through low moments. Hope is what keeps you going, even when it seems like there's no end or no avail and hope is what creates a community. A leader is strong. A leader is a problem solver. A leader is trustworthy. A leader immerses themselves. A leader is created by leaders. My dad is a leader. <laughs>talk about an extraordinary evening. Not much more than I can say, but I can just tell you that it gives me the energy that I need to keep me fueled throughout my day to keep going. I just feel ever more connected to the vital work that we do, and I've got that much more fight in me. You know, I was sitting here, I was thinking about and hearing about love when you spoke about love in this city. The great Linda Creed wrote a wonderful song that was used for my father, The Greatest Love of All, and she also was a dear friend of my beautiful mother who's here tonight. And the words to the greatest love of all really embody a lot of what I felt and what I heard tonight. It speaks about what my father believed, children are our future, teach them well, help them lead the way, show them all the beauty they possess inside, and also about learning to love yourself. And it's because of the work that we do here that no one's forgotten about and that we give voices to the voiceless and we give love to those that you know, people see nothing but fear and hatred toward and we bring light where there's darkness, as you so eloquently said. And so in the spirit of that, we close tonight, and hopefully, you know, if you're new to the work that we do, please continue to learn more about the work we do here at Juvenile Law Center. You do have, if you're inclined to give tonight, in your book, you have the QR code. Please take a look, because this is hard work, and it requires the giving. And actually, before I say goodnight, I also wanted to acknowledge my fellow board members, if they would please rise, and we give them all a huge round of applause.
I don't want to say I told you so, but as I said earlier, I think everybody knows now that there really are some amazing people here in the room tonight. And people often like to ask me, you know, what would my grandfather think? Or what would he do in this situation as we look for answers through turbulent times? And I can understand why they'd ask such a question because people are looking for leaders. And I think I can certainly say tonight that we've really inaugurated three wonderful new leaders into our community and into this world. So another round of applause for our Leadership Award winners, please. The three of you are all beacons of hope and really just think something to aspire to as a young person. And when I think of beacons of hope and as a young person, I also want to give a shout out again to our youth advocates in the room. If they could all rise for a round of applause, please. As my mother said, the children and the youth are our future. And it is the work of the Juvenile Law Center that has given opportunities and created spaces for the youth to continue to be the future and to lead us forward as we try to create a better world today. I'm really just amazed at the room that we've been able to create tonight, all the people we've been able to bring together thanks to the work of the Juvenile Law Center. So again, just a round of applause for everybody involved in making this happen. I won't keep us too long. I'm sure some people are getting hungry, but uh, I'll let this be. And I really look forward to getting to speak with you all. And thank you so much for a wonderful night so far. And I look forward to the rest of it.